Uh, good evening. Thank you all uh, for coming out on this uh, pleasant night in New York City. It's so uh, great to have such a wonderful group. We, our family considers it a great, great honor. Um, not only to hear from our very esteemed speaker in just a few moments, but to have each and every one of you here uh, to share this, this evening with us and these words of Torah. Uh, I want to just begin on behalf of my father, uh, Mr. Leon Wild, uh, my brother and sister-in-law, Michael Namie, and Jill, and all of our kids that are here, and all of my brother's kids that are here. Um, it's really an honor to welcome you to what I cannot believe is the 24th, 24th annual Yardsite Lecture for our mother, Ruth Wild, Aleha Shalom. And we are privileged to hear from an awesome, awesome personality um, a TV and Torah personality, but before I call up on before I call on uh, Rachav Sivan Meir, I wanted to share a brief thought about uh, my mother Leha Shalom, Pesel Avigal Bat Menachem, in whose memory this talk is dedicated, um, and in whose honor MGE was established 21 years ago. Uh, one of the most inspiring parts of the Torah is the reality. Uh, before I actually uh, continue on, um, I want to just also thank um, my dear colleagues, Rabbi uh, Ezra Cohen and Rabbi Joshua Klein. And I want to thank Maya and Kevin is here and Hani. And I also want to welcome my good friend friends Daniel and Rachel Krauss from the East Side, uh, formerly of MGE staff, and uh, just want to thank you for everything that you do uh, to keep MGE the, uh, the rocking place it is, thank God. So one of the most inspiring parts of the Torah is really the reality. And you don't see the reality of the lives of our patriarchs and our matriarchs as much as you do in these parshiot in Sefer Breshit, in the book of Genesis. Their challenges and their real stories that they faced in their lives. And one of those challenges was having children. All of our matriarchs, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, at one time or another, were unable to bear children. And as we will read from this week's Parsha, we read about Rachel's struggles with childbearing and how she and her beloved Yaakov, her beloved Jacob, dealt with this very challenging situation in her life. The Torah tells us, Rachel ki lo Yaakov. Rachel saw that she was not bearing children for Yaakov, and this was particularly difficult for her because her sister Leah was having child after child. Rachel bachota. And the Torah tells us very honestly that she became jealous of her sister. Vatomer Yaakov and what seems to be in some kind of desperation, she turns to her beloved Jacob and she says to him, Havalibanim, give me children. Ve'im ayin, and if not, meita anochi, I'm dead. Yaakov's response is even more difficult to understand. Vayichar af Yaakov berachel, he becomes angry. And he says to her, Hatachat elokim anochi, am I instead of God? Asher manami mech pri batem, was I the one? Am I the one who's preventing you from having children? So we can understand perhaps Rachel's distress, but Yaakov's response is difficult. How could Yaakov get angry? And the Ramban, the great Nachmanides, writes that he got angry because it seemed as though Rachel believed that a tzaddik, like her husband, Jacob, was a righteous person, can make anything happen. Sort of snap his fingers and have a child. And the Ramban also wrote that it's inconceivable that Yaakov would not have davened for Rachel already, would not have prayed for her to have a child. So now she's coming to him, and she's criticizing him for not doing anything. When it would be inconceivable, suggests Nachmanides, that he hadn't prayed for her. And that's why Yaakov answered, answered Rachel by the way he did. He got upset. 
because he felt that she somehow entertained incorrect views as in terms of the relationship of any human being or a righteous person and their prayers to God. We can't just pray and get what we want, not even at sound. And the Radak and some of the other commentators speak along similar lines, explaining that Yaakov got angry because she seemed to be attributing too much power to Yaakov. But I saw a very, what seems to be almost a progressive kind of explanation offered by the Akedat Yitzchak, Rabbi Isaac Arama, lived in the 1400s from Spain. And he says something very powerful. He says that a woman in the Torah was given two names. What are the two names that God gave women? Chava, good, and also Isha. Isha. So Isha is simply the feminine form of Ish, which is the Hebrew word for man. And Rabbi Arama, the Akira Yitzchak, teaches that this explains the idea that a woman is taken from man, Isha, and therefore, just like a man must work to advance himself intellectually, morally, so too a woman must do the same thing. She has the same purpose and role as any man, to advance herself in the fields intellectually or morally or what have you. And the second name, Chava, why, was God, why did God give the name Chava? Aim Kol Chai. She's the mother of all living. To denote the unique aspect, the childbearing aspect, that only a woman can bring life into this world. And Yaakov gets angry with, with, uh, with Rivka, suggests the Akedah Yitzchak, because by saying, Havali banim v'im ayin meita anochi, give me children or I'm dead, I have nothing left to me. Essentially what she was saying was, all I have is the childbearing aspect. That's all that defines me. She was completely denying the Isha aspect of her personality. And as important as the Torah views women having children, and I don't think anyone can underestimate how much the Torah views uh, a woman's role in terms of childbearing, there is nonetheless another dimension to womanhood, and that is to advance oneself whether it's in the intellectual realms, morally, spiritually, like any man. And this is, of course, not to negate the absolute significance and importance of having children. It's just to teach, says the Akedat Yitzchak, that it alone does not define womanhood. And I share this idea because our mother clearly viewed her role as mother, central to her existence. She absolutely loved and cherished being a mother. She took that role very seriously and with great pride. She was one of those mothers who could not stop talking about her children. She was like our walking resume. It was embarrassing, often. But at the same time, she worked on herself to develop herself spiritually and as a leader in our community in Forest Hills where uh, we were raised in Queens. Our mother was first and foremost a very religious and spiritual person she loved to learn, always running to classes, always urging our father to learn with us, which Baruch Hashem we continue to do to this day. She loved to daven, to pray regularly. She had this little book of Tehillim that I have by her bedside. And honestly, one of the most difficult things when she became ill was her inability to daven. And I used to tell her, like, uh, you know, like it was somehow helpful to to say that halachically you're, you're not required, that chola, uh, someone who's ill, is technically um, exempt from praying. But I realized very quickly that it was unhelpful because she needed to daven. She had that kind of relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. And she was a tremendous leader in the community. In the mid to late 70s, there was a huge influx of Soviet Jews. Uh, to the United States, I was convinced they all moved to my neighborhood in Forest Hills. And um, she spent a lot of time collecting furniture, clothing, helping countless families. And she was such a gracious host. Many of you have heard me speak of the way she opened her home on Shabbat to friends and to strangers alike. My first rabbi gig was in Forest Hills at the Queen's Jewish Center. And I was single, so 
you know, a big part of outreach is making Shabbos meals, which is always challenging when you don't have your own home or table. So I would schlep people home literally every Shabbos. And this was not simple for her because, you know, you get a lot of lovely, elegant people and you get some strangers, you know, not just strangers, but strange people as well. And she was just so elegant and gracious. She had this winter combination of warmth and elegance, which made people feel very welcome in our home. And this is why we dedicated MGE to her memory, to perpetuate the kindness that she so regularly practiced, the chesed that she did for so many individuals in our community. And we've tried these last 21 years to follow her model, opening our doors to literally tens of thousands of our Jewish brothers and sisters, and doing basically what our mother did every Shabbos, showing off how beautiful Shabbat is and the power of our community, and creating a venue in which, I'm very proud to say, 323 couples have met and married over these last 21 years. My mother, yeah, you can clap for that. That's a big moment. My mother was a very, very proud of that accomplishment. And she was really both a chava, she was an aim kolchai, she was a real mother, but she was also an isha. She was also someone who advanced herself morally and spiritually and helped many others to do the same. And I chose this Dvar Torah not only to speak about my mother, but to talk about the woman that we are privileged to hear from tonight, who also epitomizes this combination. Someone who has successfully combined these two powerful aspects of womanhood and ultimately creating the Kiddush Hashem, sanctifying God's name in the way that she lives personally and through her professional work as a TV personality, as an anchor woman, as an author, and as a teacher of Torah. Sivan Rachav Meir served in the Galei Tzahal, which is the army radio, she was first their correspondent for welfare and absorption, legal affairs, religious affairs, and when she finished her military service, she was appointed religious affairs reporter for Channel 2, and later their legal affairs reporter. And besides her work on Channel 2, Sivan writes for Yediot Achronot, she hosts a weekly radio show on Israel's army radio, and she's interviewed, amongst others, former, I mean, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, former Minister Shimon Perez, and more recently Sarah Netanyahu. And she has a fascinating story, which I hope she's going to share. Uh, she became religiously observant at the age of 18, and I just learned this in the other room, seventh generation Israeli, a seventh generation Israeli, and has since developed herself into a wonderful teacher of Torah. Her amazing lectures on the Parsha are attended by hundreds live and thousands more listeners throughout the world. She was voted by Globe's newspaper as the most popular female media personality in Israel, and by the Jerusalem Post as one of the 50 most influential Jews in the world. As a proud religious Zionist, a wife, a mother of five children, she combines her religious observance with her work as a successful TV reporter in doing so she serves as an awesome role model for us here at MGE and for our community and someone that I know my mother would have absolutely admired and followed. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce Sivan Michal Meir.